Thank you so much. Approving more is a myth when you can afford it. And it is also, and I don't think I also mentioned it, a great support to the economy. We will be setting up the next panel. This is a good opportunity to do exactly that. Grab the few seats that are open. And I'll give it a second. And I will, um, at this point, give a very, very, very deep thank you to the moderator of the next panel. Because I know that, I know that the, okay, does this work? It does work, right? Okay. So uh, about 30% of the audience here today is uh, actually vendors and practitioners of, and people who do the greater work of research. And I know that for the booming uh, startup uh, nation of, uh, of Israel, um, having the uh, opportunity to share these types of insights, not just in the local community, but on the international stage is a huge booster for the uh, for for their businesses. So I was especially um, uh, excited to hear that uh, this year um, the VP of Content Corporation at RSA conference, uh, the wonderful Peter Blade, uh, was willing to uh, moderate the next panel. So thank you so much for this. Um, if you have not uh, ever had the opportunity to uh, visit the RSA conference. That is an experience that we will never forget. Um, I was unfortunate enough to do this uh, just before COVID, uh, but uh, but this is the, for the if I might uh, say so, the best one, probably one of the best conferences in the world uh, at any type of topic, and uh, and definitely in uh, anything related to cyber and risk. Rita, thank you so much for coming this, uh, today. An introduction. I was gonna. <laughs> I was gonna say this is an amazing opportunity to be here at Cyber Week at FraudCon. Um, as an organizer of an event, hands off to the organizers of this event because it is a lot of work. Um, I know a lot of thought goes into you as the audience. What can um, what can you take away to do differently as you're fighting fraud within your organizations as you're working with others in the community? At the end of the day, I think that's why all of us do this with building conferences is to help the world be a safer place and help this community to really thrive and, um, and work closely with one another. Um, without further ado, I would like to, because the stars of today's panel are not me, um, it is, we've got, we've got a brilliant lineup today. Um, and I'd like to invite everyone to join me on stage. We have, and they'll be introducing themselves because I can, I can read a bio, you can read a bio, but really it's the color that comes from our guests that, um, that really put them on the map and their, and their expertise here. So, Abahey, hey, I'm working, I'm working on getting it right. Abahey, Abihai, Abihai, okay. Anna's easier, I can pronounce Anna easily. Come on down, take a seat, you're the next contestant. Um, Pedro. And rounding out our lineup, we have Daniel. Excellent. Yay. Okay. And I broke my toe, so I'm sitting because it's easier this way. Um, illustrious panel, we you introduce yourselves to our audience, providing some context of your areas of expertise in this topic area of trust and safety and, and the, the future of what we're going to discuss today. So we'll start in the end, Daniel. Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the esteemed panel. Uh, my name is Dan Rich. I'm with MasterCard, and I'm responsible for strategic growth initiatives. Part of that is working with startups. Um, I helped uh, start a startup incubation lab here in Israel in Beersheba, and um, I've been with MasterCard for about 14 years in our cyber security and innovation area. So not the core MasterCard, but in our cyber services area. Thank you. Ms. Holden? Uh, I'm the one, I'm the high. Um, I'm leading machine learning and data for the risk, fraud, credit, and customer service at PayPal. Probably forgetting a few more things. Um, 
I've been with PayPal for the last 12 years, doing uh, quite a lot. Um, I started off as a junior right seat for the company and then grew up all the way to you know, the big role for us. Uh, my teams are in charge of deploying and scaling uh, hundreds of machine learning models and uh, data solutions across PayPal uh, each six months, plus miles. Um, and we're in charge of uh, keeping trust and uh, fraud uh, for the company and maintaining our uh, business plan. Thank you. Okay. So, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? No. Okay, let's try to hold this. Is this any better? Yes. Okay, cool. So hi everybody and good morning. My name is Anna and I'm the SAP product to double verify. I'm basically responsible for our brand safety and suitability products. And it's a bit different than what the rest of the topics that we've heard about today around um, you know, payments and fraud, so I'll explain shortly. Brand safety and suitability means that we classify content on open web, apps, and social environments in order to basically identify disinformation, hate speech, violence, adult content, and other questionable topics. We then use these classifications for, for the benefits of our clients. Our clients are mostly Fortune 500 companies, client, you know, companies like Nike and Apple and Procter and Gamble who want to ensure that they don't appear next to questionable content. So we they integrate with us and we filter out and block and monitor content to ensure that they don't appear next to disinformation and junk content. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, my name is Pedro. Uh, I'm the CISO of Galicia Bank and the head of fraud prevention. Galicia Bank is the largest bank in Argentina. I'm from Argentina, too far from here, <laughs> too far. Uh, well, I'm a great fan of RSA conference. I was, I was there mm. 12 times, so so glad oh. to be with you. Well, it's obviously I'm from cybersecurity, so for that reason, I'm here talking about this, this important topic. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to start us off with a foundation of what is trust? Um, so trust to your organization, to your customers, and helping people, your customers, to feel safe. So, Avi Kai? Getting better. Yeah, by the end, by the end of that. Uh, getting better, okay. By the end, we'll make it up. All right, so, you know, trust, everyone can think about it differently. Like, when we think about trust is basically, for PayPal, that's our brand. We want uh, our customers, whenever they see the PayPal logo, they click on the button, and they use the app. We want them to know that they're perfectly safe in all the aspects, uh, you know, from zero to 100, um, to do everything they want to do in order to manage their uh, financial instruments, make purchases, or whatever it is they're trying to do, knowing that basically we got your backs, right, no matter what. But trust also means that we got your back, but it does also mean that we're enabling you to do whatever you want. So. In a perfect world, uh, they shouldn't even know we exist, right? We're there, they click on the button, we take the loan, they do whatever they need, and we're there, right? But it also means that whenever something is wrong, we want to make sure that they know, hey, I don't need to pass it over this. Someone's got my back, I'm going to reach out to customer service. Ideally, something already happened in the back end and everything is safe. I'm going to get some email and say, hey, we got your back, everything's okay. Uh, we recommend you to do one, two, three, four. But that's it. So to me, trust is almost the entire ecosystem of what a customer wants when he goes to a financial institution, doing whatever they want, but knowing that if something is wrong, someone is there and they don't need to jump through hoops uh, in order to get uh, their money back or their security back. So. Okay, so financial institution and yeah. cardholder. The other side of the coin, how do you communicate that trust to your customers so that they feel safe? Well, like PayPal, for us, uh, trust is everything. Uh, no trust, no no business. So we try to keep it for all our customers. But first, I think uh, we have to develop uh, secure products and services. And, and first thing that we have to do is to influence in the company. We are like cyber team, only 1% of the whole company. So we have to influence all the company. Uh, they have to build we have to do together uh, secure products and services, and then we have to inform our, all our customers. One of our strategic points is to keep
keep our world, our customers. It is very difficult to change the culture of, of a company. Imagine, I don't know, the population here is 9 million in Israel. 9 million, well, we have 4 million, more than 4 million customers. Imagine change the culture of the half of this world. So it's, a, it's, a, it's too tough, but it's, the, the, I think it's the best way to, to, to that the customer can think that trust in, on us. They are, they are leaving all their money in our bank. So it's, it's very important. So for me, the, the, the best thing is to keep a word there and they, they gonna feel that we are really, the, 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 the cyber really is important for us. Uh, of course, pro prevention. Sure, Daniel. Uh, sure, so for MasterCard, 50 years, um, consumers have trusted us to ensure that their transactions um, go through. Merchants have trusted us uh, that the consumers that they're working with are who they say they are. Um, issuers on the other side uh, trust us that they will get settled in their payments, and we sit in the middle ensuring that this entire network works um, as one. Now, after this 50-year period of this four-party system, we see many, many more vulnerabilities, more devices, IoT, lots more suppliers in this value chain and ecosystem. Uh, this trust gets more quickly eroded. Any breach that happens uh, through uh, multiple parties and uh, the subsequent multiple layers of suppliers impacts our ecosystem. So trust is critical, um, but it's becoming more and more difficult to ensure that trust uh, as the complexity and the digital digital acceleration uh, continues to happen. Uh, so it's, a, it's an ongoing game. Great, so to the difficulty and acceleration, as our panel was preparing um, generative AI, Right, that's right at the core of so much change that's happening so quickly. And as we were talking about things and, and you know thoughts we wanted to make sure we infused with you today, um, we spent a lot of time here. So Anna, I wanted you to, um, to lead us off if you could with um, generative AI. Does this mean that risks are getting more scale, more sophistication? What are you seeing? Sure. Um, so it's a wonderful question. And the short answer is both. <clears throat> Generative AI helps <coughs> sorry, helps better players both with their sophisticated capabilities and with scale. And to give you a sense, basically, I would say that generative AI poses the biggest risk for disinformation or for us as players who are trying to prevent disinformation. Around so disinformation, hate speech, um, and CSAM. For anyone who doesn't know, that CSAM is the industry term for child pornography. What generative AI, AI enables bad players to do is to be to create content which is misleading and fake much more easily, much more quickly, in a, in a much more accessible and scalable way, so that they can spread their basically messages in a wider manner. And I want to give a specific example around hate speech because I think we're in Israel, something we can relate to. Um, so. I'm sorry, I'm just really mad at you in Israel. But never mind. The, the, the concept here is that uh, players can do an abundance of different things around generative AI. One is that they, for example, can train models on historic content about different minority groups uh, from, all around, from all across history and then create new hate speech, new narratives, new ideas based on that historic content. Another thing that they can do with you is create deep fakes, basically different videos or sometimes images that, per, that they use as um, proofs for different claims and stories that they've made up. Like, here, sure, see, this is, this is real because I'm showing you a video of a person who is saying what I just told you that he's saying. And third, which is important both for our hate speech and our business, is their ability to basically create a lot of different variations. Um, if previously, like, there are a lot of disinformation sites. And in the past, it would take you some time to create a new site because you need to create new, new types of content, new variation, new stories. You need, to, you need to do some actual work. Now you can create variations really, really easily with generative AI. 
Um, so I think that these these types of themes are consistent, whether it's CSAM or hate speech or disinformation, and we see substantially more scale and sophistication um, for these bad actors. Thank you. Um, I'll be Kai. <laughs> yes, okay. Hey. No, it's hard to say your name. I want you to take the next question for us. <laughs> um, is Gen AI already learning from this content? So I think I think the answer is yes, but I wanna step back for a second and explain something about how the again relate to the previous one about how does Gen AI escape, right? Because I think that's the most important mm -hmm. thing in context. So Imagine that in a world of, you know, a lot of people here are product experts, but I know, I know from the industry. A few years ago, we would say, hey, you know what? Fraud attacks happen at scale, but it's usually not a sophisticated type of fraud. It's the list that got out, it's someone like who has password, that's fine. And the thing that we always said is, you know what? The perfect fraud, it's almost impossible to stop, but it cannot happen at any scale. So, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't say we live with it, but, you know, it's under control. I think that what Gen AI, Gen AI does, as we talked about scale, is really it explodes the sophisticated fraud. I'll give, I'll give two examples. So the first one is what we all like to encounter with account takeovers, right? So account takeovers, someone has your password, you got, you're all using the same password in the same place, most of you. It's fine, it gets out, and don't do it. <laughs> in case you are doing it, when someone logs into your account or tries to do something, then we're gonna try and see, hey, you know what, is it really you? We're gonna look at consistency, we're gonna look at a lot of stuff. But eventually, people will log into the device from Thailand or from other places and tell us like, what is, we call a good story that maybe seems bad, but we wanna label customers. We talked about trust, right? If someone tries to log into their, from their, to their account or location and I don't let them, trust is all of this. Almost as instant as that. So all of a sudden, um, Someone can use Gen AI to uh, mimic some signals on the web, photos from vacation, post on social media, and say, oh, well, hey, maybe it's, uh, you know, Brita, she's on vacation in Thailand, I don't know, but hey, here is a post that she uh, put on her LinkedIn page or something similar, and all of a sudden, this looks completely real. All the grammar is great. Someone can put a picture, boof, we spoof the APO, and it's as easy as that, right? We do it with the snap of the finger. Another example is stolen identity. Again, we talked about super identities. Once we say, hey, you know what? Really forging someone's identity is very hard. You need documents, you need all this stuff. Now, all of a sudden, hey, I get a list of social security numbers. They're everywhere. I can generate driver license, IDs, bank statements, everything cross reference from around the web. Everything checks out. You can use image generator. The picture is going to look great. Kind of, are probably going to be 3D, so all of the very sophisticated kind of scanners are going to get spooked as well. And all of a sudden, you got yourself millions of perfect identities of legitimate people. And guess even even worse, when those people are going to come to us and say, "It's not us," we're going to say, "Hey, here's everything, right? What do you want? You're trying to abuse us." So. I think HGNAI is learning from that context, and again, going back to your original question, that thing is going to get much, much harder. I don't want to, I don't want to scare everyone. We got it. Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's definitely learning from the context, improving, making all these spoof identities and content much more sophisticated. That's going to be, I believe, the major challenge for the fraud industry in the in the coming years. Thank you. Um, so Pedro. How has jet AI and synthetic data affected the landscape of fraud and risk? And how can organizations like yours, like those represented here, best prepare? Well, I'd like to say that AI is the democratization of AI. Uh, why? Because anyone can use it. In cybersecurity, we were using, we have been using AI and different, most of our tools. Um, EDRs, and Caspi, most of, of our tools use AI, but now it's a democratization. What's the difficult word I chose? I chose. Like uh, <laughs> like <laughs> um, Why? Because I think here's an expert of AI, but all, uh, all the train, the AI, AI train costs continue plummet. Uh, 
uh, in 2020 to, to, to train uh, GPT-3 cost $4.6 million. In 2022, $450,000, more, uh, less than 10%. So the game just started. And, and I think uh, we have different kind of, of tools to work. For example, uh, in, in our bank internally, we, we try to block all the upload of code and customer data uh, to ChatGPT or BART. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what for for for, for work, working on with fraud prevention, we have different kind of tools, like for example, uh, biometric behavior like BioCatch, and so that that's a main sponsor. Um, again, we have to work. With, with, the, with the people of data analytics, create their models uh, to, to try to be more proactive. That, that's, that's a big challenge for us. Great. So Dan, I want to shift to you. What changes are already in the works at your organization to tackle some of these new risks that we've talked about, to um, you know, the change of organizational, there's all kinds of changes probably in flux. Uh, sure, so I, I just wanted to sort of reiterate, generative AI just reduces the barriers of entry for criminals. It makes it so much easier for a criminal to get into the game um, and not only create identities, uh, look for stolen credentials, car data, et cetera, it's easy. Um, but generative AI also allows criminals, hackers, fraudsters to generate code um, without having to do any coding. Uh, they just you know put it into the semantic system and it outputs some code, which makes it really really difficult for companies like ours to try and stop that. Um, so our models also have to continually improve um, and look at what are those risks. How do we look at bot generated or automated automated systems to try and stop them? Um, some of the things that we're doing in, in particular is uh, looking at a little bit more broadly. Um, not only at the transaction space, but also at the supplier space. Uh, so what we found, uh, not necessarily specifically uh, to generative AI, but what we found most of the breaches happen not only within your enterprise, but in relationships that you have uh, with your suppliers around your ecosystem. And so we have done um, a, a great deal of work looking at the supplier relationship, looking at the supplier uh, level of uh, cyber hygiene, uh, and attempted to raise not only that enterprise or the franchise in our world, whether it be the merchant or the issuing bank or the acquiring bank or the processor, but their suppliers as well. Great. Anna, has your, has your organization taken on any new changes? Sure. Um, so I think that in our case, we're again talking about the classification of content and content like the information and the issues that are. So the way that we the way that we used to handle it is basically by classifying the domain or the entity level. What this means is that we would classify a certain domain as this information or a certain, case, a certain entity as an entity that consistently creates hate speech. Now with the pro proliferation of, of these types of content and the easiness uh, in which bad actors can create more, we're basically shifting to classification at the post or the tweet level. So the very small units of content that bad actors create. Um, I'm going to try. Can I speak without it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll try this one. Oh, okay. That, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, so transition. Okay. Transitioning to to classifying on the smallest level is going to enable us to to deal with this new level of scale and such. Great. And Pedro, from the big bank perspective, what changes have you put in place in response to these risks? Uh, well, I think I, I, I try to think positive. Um, Great. Because, we need to go positive. Yes. <laughs> I, I want to explain. <laughs> because you can create in seconds with ChatGPT or Bart, you can create in seconds patients, you can create in seconds malwares, uh, you can create in seconds ransomware, but you can create in seconds secure code, respecting, for example, OWASP 10. 
Um, so I think we have a big tool, um, of course, the process has AI, and we have AI too. So uh, I really stay positive about the perspective and the future uh, of what we have, uh, how we handle this, this problem. Great. I, I appreciate that, because sometimes I think we tend to focus on all of the bad and the gloom and doom and we're just as smart mm -hmm. and we can be smarter so um so job, job security yep. job security <laughs> here at a university yes job security um so thank you thank you for taking us there so i want to um i want to do a quick round robin to all of us we'll start on the end and work our way this way what is the most important takeaway for our audience from the conversation concerns Opportunities, positivities, what you're excited about. Where should where should they be focused for the next year of life? Um, wow, I, I didn't really think this one through super well. Or I think maybe you changed the wording on the, on the question. <laughs> or it's jet lag. Or it's jet lag. It must be jet lag. Um, you know, so for me, the I think the biggest um, concern that I have or see, and, and uh, many companies are attempting to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the communication space, so the system to system communication, or whether it's communication within an organization or outside of the organization, this passing of data, right? This is our world is now data rich. And this passing of data um, across systems is super, super vulnerable. Um, so I, I see a lot in the space of API security. Um, and if you don't have a system, this is something that MasterCard, um, you know. Uh, provides a service around, but if you haven't um, looked into API security, I think that's one area which is pretty critical um, and one that uh, keeps me up and I think about quite a lot um, as we think about suppliers and relationships, etc. Uh, the second, the second one that I um, would give as a takeaway for folks to think about is um, you know relatively new. There's some companies in the space, startup companies I'll be meeting with some this week um, in the digital risk protection or digital brand protection. Uh, space, which is really interesting, uh, particularly for us um, as we support small business owners and consumers. It's uh, the spoofing of merchant websites, it's the spoofing of MasterCard branded things, it's the spoofing, spoofing of individuals and VIPs and executives um, with ChatGPT and gener uh, generative AI. That's really a space that uh, is going to become a real big problem for us as an industry. Those are the two that I would say as takeaways to start thinking about. So let's be positive, right? Let's be positive. Okay, so let's talk about job security. Uh, super important, right? Look, uh, we talked about Gen AI last, and at the end of the day, uh, the key takeaway that I feel that you know we should all take, and what we're actually implementing also is trying to understand that we're not going to beat the perfect fraud with brute force AI, perfect kind of trying to model. At the end of the day. Um, as I think was wisely said, we can use AI too, but we have to use it smartly. And this is where we, as experts in this domain, should and have to apply our business knowledge and expertise um, into this. I'll say it in two ways, right? So we talked about job security. So you're not going to write a 10 deep level deep learning model better than a chat GPT, right? If you generate code better, if you optimize better than you, that's, you know, that's like two years ago. What we should do as experts in this domain is really to go to the places where, uh, you know, it sounds apocalyptic, the machine didn't beat us yet, right? And we said, like, you know, it takes time, you know, probably, the, sorry, probably there's going to be a new model that's going to obsolete everything I say next week, but um, the machine still takes time to learn. It needs much more example. It doesn't know how to build complex, as I say, stories. It just knows how to integrate data and come up with probabilities. Our biggest advantage as professionals and as people who understand the business, not just machine learning, is we higher than us build these models that are trying to kind of capture human intelligence, how a human would learn almost, and then apply that into the ecosystem while using the Gen AI to do the, um, the simple logistics. I call it. Not everything has to be a complicated model, but again, trying to beat. Uh, super fraud, kind of high scale of school thing, Gen AI thing, with your own Gen AI, that's just not going to work. That's at least my, uh, my take away. 
Um, so it, you know, the elections in the U.S. are, are upcoming, and so are in, in many other countries in Europe and around the world. And we also see that hate speech is increasing globally. In the U.S. specifically, we see much more anti-Semitism and other types of hate against LGBTQ, and we're seeing it all around the world. Yes. I think that this combination of a time where when hate speech is increasing and also elections, which are usually you know, uh, something that increases the amount of, of disinformation, the combination between that and generative AI creates a situation where we as trust and safety players need to work much, much harder in order to develop new methods and new systems that we're collaborating much closer this year with different companies and, and research bodies and, and <coughs> universities in order to ensure that we are catching these lead players and classifying this content as well as possible. Pedro, bring us home. Well, uh, my biggest concern <laughs> is the gap culture. Um, it, it's the people culture against the pace of changing. So for that reason, uh, I, I think the best tip to take from here is try to keep aware always your customers, try to keep aware always your company. Uh, of course, try to, to work together with, with AI teams and pro teams and cyber teams. Great. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Hopefully, people have some good takeaways from the important conversation today. Thank you.